Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to our Curious Amalgam, a podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is Alicia Downey, and the title of today's episode is, Who is Rahat Khanan Hassan? Meet the Chairperson of the Competition Commission of Pakistan. Rahat Khanan Hassan is one of four current and former competition agency heads, all women, who were featured panelists at the Antitrust Law Section's annual spring meeting in Washington, D.C. in March 2022. There simply wasn't enough time to do these inspiring panelists justice. So by popular demand, we are dedicating an episode of our Curious Amalgam to each of them. In this episode, we will ask Chairperson Hassan to give us a brief overview of Pakistan's competition regime and tell us about some of the Commission's most newsworthy accomplishments under her leadership. We'll also find out a little bit about her own professional journey to the top. Joining me today is my co-host, Anant Rao. Hello, Anant. Hello, Alicia. Anant, would you like to introduce our guest? I would be delighted to. Rahat Konan Hassan studied law at King's College London and worked in private practice as a senior partner of a leading Islamabad-based law firm, Hassan Konan Nafis. In 2007, she became a founding member of the Competition Commission of Pakistan. While she served as chairperson from 2010 to 2013, the commission was twice nominated among the top five agencies for the Global Competition Review's Enforcement Agency of the Year Award. In 2020, she was again appointed to the chairperson position. Rahat's career in public service also includes serving as the first female director on the board of Pakistan's Stock Exchange and as general counsel and executive director at the Securities and Exchange Commission of Pakistan. Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, Rahat. Happy to be here. Thank you. Rahat, many of our listeners are familiar with competition enforcement in the U.S. and the EU, but maybe not so much Pakistan. What is the structure of the competition enforcement system in Pakistan? As brief as I can be, just to let you know that competition law existed in Pakistan, like in Bangladesh and in India, in some form since 1970. But the revamping of the law took place in 2007. And the major differences, which is important to understand, was that prior to 2007, the focus was on undue concentration of economic power and unfair trade restrictive practices. Whereas In 2007, it has been revamped entirely in line with the modern antitrust law, and we had the late movers advantage as well. I'll just talk about the differences, the biggest ones, like so for people to understand broadly, it's based on Treaty of Rome, and uh, we regulate the four pillars are the cartelization, which is prohibited agreements, abuse of dominance, mergers and acquisitions, and interestingly, deceptive marketing practices, which does not exist in India or Bangladesh. What are the differences? If you can say earlier it was toothless, we have now fangs. And if earlier it was passive, we are proactive. That's primarily with enhanced enforcement tools such as leniency, search and inspection, forcible entry, and much higher penalties, like 10% of the turnover. Like globally, that's what exists in other jurisdictions. There are a number of similarities between Pakistani and U.S. competition law. Price fixing, for example, is illegal in Pakistan, as it is under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Is it a criminal offense in Pakistan? No, it isn't. Tell us a little bit about the history and the organization of the Competition Commission. It's a relatively new organization, right? Yes. Uh, We started in 2007. Uh, We had five members. Uh, The first chair was Khalid Mirza, myself, a founding member, and we had the other, one female and three male members. Then in 2010, I was made the chair. That was on the recommendation of Mr. Khalid Mirza, the first chair. Initially, it was not a a process through which you didn't have a competitive process for appointment. Now, currently, this last appointment have been through competitive process. It has been a women-empowered commission, if you look at it. I was the first regulatory head when I was made the chair. 
Oh, that's great to hear. Can you tell us some of the most significant or newsworthy cases or initiatives that have happened under your leadership, either in your previous term or, or currently to date? There are five, six milestones which I believe we have achieved during the first term and my second term as well. And I'll only mention the the big ones. It's the transition from an ordinance into an act. That was the first one. And from 2007 till 2010, we had ordinances one after another. It would lapse for four months. Two, we had certain inspections earlier only of the association. During my term, we started inspecting companies, private, public, and listed. That was quite a resistance faced. Third, uh, we had moved the and shifted the office. And I I feel very proud that whosoever comes to the office, they, they don't believe it's a it's a public sector office. It has a touch of feng shui. Uh, open, bright, and clear. That's what people say. I'm just using those terms. These are not my words. And uh, and also a compliment that I cannot forget, it has a woman's touch. So I think administratively that was very, very important to have a good environment because you're regulating corporate sector. This is the first time recently I have exercised casting vote while imposing the highest penalty. If you do my litmus test, I'm an enforcer. So I believe in enforcement. That's why I'm here. And we had the highest penalties being imposed during my term, even earlier and even now. Casting vote exercised act transition, financial autonomy achieved, which is a major milestone we have recently achieved in October after a struggle since 2008-2009. So these are some of the major ones. And then we have some landmark cases whenever you would like to. Well, that that was my next question. Are there particular um, industry sectors where you feel the agency has made a real noticeable impact, uh, decisions that kind of send a message? Yes, I, I... I seriously believe that we have sent the message, but it will be only well received when the judicial review will come. Uh, so it's telecom, it's fertilizer, urea, it's um, poultry, it's uh, sugar industry, particularly. And recently, we have imposed the highest penalty ever, which is around 44 billion park rupee, comes out around 219 million dollars. So yes, we have demonstrated independence. That's what I call it. Because when you take on powerful lobbies, the regulator is expected to exercise power fairly and transparently. I believe that we have done a good job because we have written speaking orders which are on the website and people can decide. You see, I'm not saying we are not capable of making mistakes, but we have taken global jurisdictions into account, what's happening in the world. We just don't go blindly and we are not whimsical about it. You know, you mentioned uh, that there was a, a bit of a impact when the commission started focusing on private companies and other corporate interests. Was was that a, a challenge? Can you describe that in some more detail? Yes, without naming the entities, uh, my first search and inspection when my team went there, they were kept in a room and they had to call help of the media. And it was very difficult for me because I was asked to be taken on, uh, you know, on the channel saying, oh, your people have been withheld. What would you do? And I think that helped us to keep a very calm view saying they, they view it as trespass of their boundaries. Uh, we, I'm sure they'll come around and my team will be able to convince. It was 12 hours of struggle. Eventually, my team returned very successful, a lot of evidence that led eventually to a leniency case, the one and only. What are your priorities as chair? On the enforcement side, we'll continue uh, as much as we can in concluding cartel investigations and unveiling those because I believe in Pakistan, that's a norm and that's not an exception. On the policy side, I believe commission has to discharge the role of a catalyst in terms of making government frame such policies that are not focused on fixing prices or controlling prices, allowing markets to work and function. Because we 
we strongly believe in having free markets. And the moment you start regulating prices, that's the challenge. And I have to share one thing here. Many, it's, it's been a very difficult challenge that public's understanding of competition law and policy is very low. And with the government, government departments as well, somehow we come across as a price regulator. Whereas we are not price regulators, it's the antithesis of competition. So we have to make them understand that we are not price regulators, we regulate behavior and what harm and what are the unintended consequences when you try to regulate prices. You touched on something about the public perception of competition regulation. One of the reasons we have a populist antitrust movement in the U.S. is that antitrust has literally become more popular. Ordinary people, non-practitioners are talking about it. They've grown concerned over the size of some companies, over the degree of consolidation in certain industries, and skeptical of the benefits that traditional antitrust economics tells them that they have received. What is the public perception of competition in Pakistan? Is there a sense... Some people feel in the U.S. that big companies are too big and mergers should be more strictly controlled. I feel we are several years behind in many respects in terms of the common man's understanding of competition law. As I mentioned, we started late and it's a bit low. Yet, I feel there is a lot of expectation because recently, you know, what has happened that Competition Commission has been completing its investigation. It has got a lot of focus in the media as well. Imposing huge penalties has also been, you know, well received. And at the same time, they expect that would did some magic wand with which things would be reformed. This is a long process and it would take time. But I feel as far as the consumers are concerned, there might be more expectations. They're becoming more aware. And as far as the lawyers are concerned, the competition bar is concerned, it has started registering them. And it was interesting, I must share that our case of constitutionality, I oh, oh, I have to mention one thing in the earlier question, you had asked two things and I, I missed out. One was that recently we have uh, from f- after a decade, the courts have decided finally that competition law is a federal subject. There was the whole debate was going on whether the federation could have legislated the competition law or not, or whether it's in the province's domain. Finally, Lahore High Court did it. Islamabad High Court has endorsed it. And Sindh High Court has also endorsed it. That's a big victory. And these 10 years of argument has helped in advocacy of competition law as well, because all younger lawyers in one way or the other have assisted their seniors in preparation of the case. So there is awareness about the law, I would say. And as on a lighter note, I always say we have promoted competition amongst lawyers. That's an excellent thing too. In terms of your perception of the commission by the public, I just wanted to alert listeners uh, that your uh, commission recently produced a video that's on YouTube, and we will put a link of, on that on the episode webpage. It was in celebration of International Women's Day, is that correct? And mm-hmm. in the video, we meet many of the people that work for you, uh, including the nannies in the daycare, and we could see your beautiful offices. Can you tell us a little bit about what led to that video? Uh, yes, Uh Last year, we had also celebrated, but mostly in-house. We had invited a few guests. It was quite a quick thing. So we had prepared a five within five days an in-house documentary. This time, we really improved it. And uh, the topic that we had kept in this regard was policy and regulation through a gender lens. And we invited all the regulators. We gathered over 100 females on this. We had eminent speakers and I have recently formed a task force as well in this regard. So uh, what led me to do this was primarily, I I have to say, I am a gender blind person. That's how I have been raised. Yet I do recognize as, as a female, there are challenges at workplace. I may not have faced some, but many face it. And we have to create an enabling environment. So this crash facility was also started at my time. Another feather in the cap, if I may say so. And I, when I joined the commission in 2007, my child was not yet one year old. I had to request the chair to provide me the crash facility. 
uh, he gave me a small room and i had my own attendant to attend when i came he was 3 plus he was going to school so i thought maybe i should pass on this benefit to my females as well and recently you know what we have done we have we have been giving them flexi timings and the creche facility in the last term and this time now i've given them access on their mobile phone so they can monitor wherever they are they don't have to visit the creche facility or the daycare these are little things you can do just to make them happy and more comfortable at their work i i i did my uh, i must share that i started my career in 93 and before getting my degree actually 6 months before i got my degree <laughs> and uh, till now i've only taken time off is for my masters one year and 3 months as a housewife that's it my four kids have been raised through and through in this period Oh that's great. But and yes, going back to the very beginning, what uh led you to have an interest in competition law? Competition law as well as public service. I would talk about both. Um uh, initially when uh the Competition Act was being finalized, I was not part of that, but I was as, as part of the consultant engaged to draft regulations. And when I started studying, that was my introduction to competition law. I found it so dynamic, so interesting. You know, getting into all the industries, I thought this would be so exciting. And when I was made this offer, they told me this is no brainer, brainer, you better join as member. So I did. <laughs> it's it's it has nexus with reality everyday life and a lot of learning in all segments of economy so i think that's you're very fortunate if you get that exposure that's what i like about it too how about you anan me as well you mentioned uh that you are a mother of four are there challenges and opportunities for women in public service uh or in law generally that you think might be unique to pakistan given its history and culture what makes it more challenging in pakistan may be the lack of literacy uh, less awareness uh, but overall i feel when we are talking about the challenges for professional women i have to share that we are seven sisters now one is in uk and the other is in us and when we share and we talk and they are also in senior positions they we have the same things to share about the same kind of biases the same kind of things that anybody who comes to so i don't see it peculiar to law or to uh, pakistan i feel it has a global um, what is the right word there's a commonality there's a commonality so that should not be a discouragement they i have to say yes there are issues and we can address above all what depends is your own determination that's that's the way i look at it It's also interesting um is even though there are these challenges that women face globally Pakistan is in some ways an outlier in terms of the um the women leaders that we have seen I was thinking of Benazir Bhutto first woman to lead a democratic government in a muslim majority country yeah this- <laughs> I don't know how to end that comment but but it is it is impressive I think uh what we've seen in Pakistan and there is a lot of room there is a lot of room for us to perform as well once you cross a certain barrier then they and and i must admit a, a lot of support has come from my male bosses my spouse my father my brother apart from yes your parents and siblings you see i have to acknowledge there are a lot of men who are very positive in supporting i don't want to paint paint them as the other ones who are stopping us there are cultural biases there are unconscious biases there are females who are pulling <laughs> others so it's not just males who were doing it your own colleagues can be playing that role i just don't want to make it totally focused on male versus female i don't see them as opposites that's what i want to say they complement each other they have similarities and they may have may not have similarities what was the best career advice you received about dealing with gender bias that was the advice of my mother to have a gender blind vision <sighs> you never treat yourself as a female don't allow yourself to be used or abused don't use or abuse either so i think you have to remain as a professional that's the first rule i think we're ready to move into our uh, final segment and this is when we get to know a little bit more about our guest as a person 
Uh, so something we ask everybody is to tell us something interesting about yourself that is outside of your professional life. Things that I enjoy doing as in my free time, when I strongly feel about something, I do poetry. How long have you written poetry? Quite some time after my marriage. <laughs> is there a poem that you can recite for us? Uh, yes, but I have to say that I do it in my own language. And I'm very fortunate that my husband, uh, he translates and he translates it really well. He's done it with other poets and I, he opted to do one for me as well. Can I share that? Or Unfortunately, most of our listeners yeah. are probably listening in English. So, so please go ahead. Madawa means remedy at, or the regret that whether you can make it up. Words turn poisonous or perhaps wounds dress. Pick the word to attack or like a shield to hold back. What all was heard, said and done, just cause battle of words had begun. None they could claim victory, neither a defeat for the other to see. As much as we were bitter and stern, detached now stand, toss and turn. What cure now may offer all boundaries we have crossed over. Oh, that's great. I wish we had a studio audience because I think we would hear lots and lots of loud applause. That's just great. This is the first guest who ever recited their own poem. I can only poem. imagine what it sounds like in the Urdu as well. Yeah, yeah. For listeners who enjoyed that, we'll be posting that poem on the episode webpage. Thank you so much. Rahat, which is better? Test match format or 2020? 2020. I'm an action <laughs> person. <laughs> <laughs> that was for, for our the- listeners, we're discussing cricket formats, and the test match is five days. I, mean, I, I don't even understand who has that kind of time. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a 2020 yeah, person. Cricket's Since a childhood, thing I love Pakistan, one day cricket. Yes. <laughs> now we're going to enter into the final segment of our program. It's a little game we call The Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. Now, once upon a time, we had a hat and we would pull numbers out of the hat and they would correspond to a question. But the game has evolved, uh, given that we're recording this virtually. So, Rahat, please pick a number between 1 and 10 and I will read you the surprise question that corresponds to that number. One. If you could host your own podcast... What would it be about? It has to be about public service. Really? Who, who would be your guests? All people who are the unsung heroes, who may have done and contributed a lot, but they're not there and the public does not know them. I kind of thought you might answer that you would have a poetry podcast, but... Oh, no, that's very personal to me. So I, oh. so I, I've just shared because you asked me that question and I've never made it public, but I thought maybe this is the time I should. But I, oh, I really well, believe, I, I, I just have to add that public service for me is like, I passionately feel there's everyone who's in public service with whatever they're expected to do, if they do it, they can make a difference. That the problem is we'd only look at the big things and not the smaller steps that, that can make a difference. I think little things count so much in life. And if all of us can do that, it will really change the whole the, the, the whole framework and the paradigm change will come. Well, that's a very inspiring answer. Thanks so much for being our guest on our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of our Curious Amalgam. A competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at, at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.